Please remain standing. Everybody get up. I want you to act like your foot is on the devil's neck. So, does anybody feel that way right now? You know, uh, we're going to say some things, and you know I'm very non-controversial, <laughs> non-confronting, easy to swallow. But I want all of you to do something for me, okay? I have a rule that whenever people clap for me, they have to give twice as much to Jesus Christ. Would you? Only him. Only him. Let's get ready for some true miracles of God. We're not going to wait till tonight. You might as well get healed today, right now. How many of you would rather come tonight healed than to come for healing? That way you'll have to go get someone else and bring them. Well, you may be seated. We're going to get busy right now. The modern American has the attention span of a housefly. We stare at devices, am I right? We're all day long. And because of that, public speaking tends to use a lot of props. And as you can see, I don't have any props today. I don't have the skinny jeans, the fog machine, but I do have the big screens. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about that. I believe that one of the reasons that modern preachers fail is because they don't value their audience's time. We are overscheduled. Your child is going through a lot with all the schedule you're putting them through. I know I'm starting trouble right now. And one thing that I am convinced is satanic, and my wife will agree with me, and that reminds me, my wife is here. And I want to ask my wife to stand. This is Michelle Marillo. Would you greet her right now? Woman of God, woman of God. She and Kelly are now a very dangerous friendship. Very dangerous. The devil said, uh-oh. <laughs> but I want to tell you something about your, your time. If you don't have something valuable to offer an audience, sit down and shut up. Can I, I should have gotten a loud amen on that. Look, I worked on that in front of a mirror. I thought I was going to get thunderous applause, and I, I, I got a gentle spring rain. How many of you know, if you don't have an anointed message from God, sit down and shut up. Yeah. If Al Gore really believed that hot air was heating the Earth's atmosphere, he would shut up. I mean, I just, I can't believe I said that, Mari. Why is this? That doesn't have anything to do with what you're talking about today. But because your time is important, I'm going to get right to the point. There's a strange combination in me. I'm German and Latin. That means that I get emotional and I get logical. So my German side gets very analytical and logical and my Latino side gets emotional. So I was on a, in a place where a man insulted me. We were on an airplane and he insulted me. And the Latino side of me said, kill him. And the German side said, control your emotions so that you can think of ways to kill him. <laughs> so this strange paradox in my personality and in my background is such that I am from the University of California at Berkeley. And I went there to win souls during the anti-war movement. 
So nothing in Washington is a surprise for me. And I've come to believe that a lot of presidential elections are the same every four years. We get three choices, Bo, Larry, or Curly. And uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. But my feeling about the left and leftism and why I go after woke the way I do in my soul winning sermons is needs to be understood before you get anything from this. Number one, I do believe very strongly that a minister is supposed to be against evil. Now wave your hand at me if you believe that. All right, they're supposed to be against evil. Yes, we got that from the highest source just now. So now, so now let's look at this for a moment. For how many years did I preach against drugs by name? I named the drugs. No one ever accused me of being a pharmacist. But when I began to expose the evil on the left, suddenly I was a politician. And they think, well, you changed your message. No, I didn't change my message. That when the devil puts on a new costume, I still know it's the same devil. Now, I worked on that one. I'm not letting you get away with that one. All right, that's right. And the devil is virtue signaling. The devil is virtue signaling, saying, this is for the greater good. This is for your future. This is for you. The next thing I want to tell you is that God has called me to reach young people. And I am very thrilled with the fact that our audiences are getting younger and younger. Yes, they are. And they are coming to our meetings in record numbers to get saved. To give you, there's, a, there's a gang in in the city of Bakersfield. That's where our last tent crusade was. There's a gang there in the city of Bakersfield and because of one man, his name is Manuel Carrizales. He's a great man of God that runs Stay Focused Ministries in Bakersfield. He told that gang they needed to come to my tent. I'm gonna try this side over here. He told the gang that they had to come to my tent. A vicious drug dealing, murderous gang 40 of them showed up yeah 20 of them were born again in Jesus name one of them was a young man in the last stages of fentanyl addiction his name is Luis and Luis came forward and one of the reasons that we had them there is there's two reasons. One is Manuel Carrizales. The other is with us today, Frank Saldana, who leads Inner City Action. <laughs> Frank, stand up, man. Give him a great, great big hand. Yeah, we know Frank. Well, this young man has come to the front. I see death all over him. And he's getting born again and the Holy Spirit says, tell him that he has cancer. And I said, you're not only addicted to drugs, you have cancer. And the look on his face, we actually have a photograph of that moment. And the power of God struck him. No withdrawals from fentanyl. He was healed, <laughs> saved, and then went with Frank to be a part of Inner City Action where he is now in training. My God. Somebody said amen. amen. All right, we're getting to our point right here, which I just said we need to and you're not doing it, Mario, so what's the matter with you? So we're gonna get to the point. We're bringing the tent to Colorado Springs. Right? I want all of you to volunteer to be a part of it. I know that you would love to sit in the meeting, enjoy the worship and be blessed and healed, but I want you to go to a new level. 
And that new level is, I want you to be a soldier in the Army at the tent. Now, here's what, <laughs> here's what I'm expecting. Colorado Springs, I believe we will see more people saved and healed in four days than in any crusade in our history. Clap your hands real loud if you believe that. Yes, yes. Secondly, we will see this city impacted. I believe there's gonna be a cultural shift in the city as a result of this tent crusade. And one thing you need to know, our last tent was 18, 19,000 square feet. This one is almost 40,000 square feet. Now, 40,000 square feet will cover an entire football field. So we're gonna give you all 50 yard line seating, but I want you to know it's four stories high and it's gonna sit at the two main intersections where Church for All Nations on their campus, everybody in Colorado Springs is gonna see that tent. And out of that tent is gonna come the glory and the fire of Almighty God. All right, here's the point. There are two forces that affect every generation. One is prophecy and the other is policy. And I want you to repeat after me. Say prophecy, prophecy. And, policy. and policy. Policies are the laws and the edicts and the force of the military economic might of nations and men and women that run those nations. Policy. Prophecy is what God says is going to happen at a given time to a given group of people. You're not gonna like what I'm about to say, so I'm gonna say it with a smile. <laughs> the reason we have so many false prophets right now is because of how important the gift of prophecy is to the next phase of what God's gonna do in America. Now, the false prophets are gonna be replaced by true prophets. And you're gonna see young prophets. And you're gonna see young men and young women act in the office of the prophet with true prophetic power. Now, what are they gonna do? They're gonna speak the truth to evil leaders. They're gonna stand under their balcony and prophesy in the name of Jesus. And unlike the crop of fakes that we have right now, what they prophesy will actually come to pass. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, let you off the hook and amen myself. Amen, Mara, that was good right there. Now, Okay, sometime you have to lead by example. So everybody, everybody said, say praise the Lord. Praise say glory to God. Because here comes the question. Thank you. I, I get all the help I can. You do that again, you get a free book. Now, what I want you to do is answer the question. How many of you in this room, has God told you that Colorado Springs will be a center for natural awakening? Stand up if he told you that. You heard God say that. You, you did. I, all right. I'm going to tell you, some of these people might be emotional. Some of them might be following the crowd, but all of them can't be wrong. You may be seated. Everybody that wants God to turn Colorado Springs into a national center of awakening, shout, clap your hands, give God the glory. It's what we want. It's what we want. So here we go. We've established together that there is a prophetic word that has come from the throne of God that says Colorado Springs will be a ground zero for a national revival. I believe it'll be stronger than what happened at Asbury University. Secondly, I believe 
that it will even eclipse the Jesus movement in its power and its spread. So, what does that do? Many of you went to see the Jesus Revolution movie. Problem is, my wife said, honey, you have to go see it. I said, darling, that's a very emotional request because I lived that movie. I was in that movie. I used to have a, a regular lunch with Lonnie Frisbee. I knew Chuck Smith. Greg uh, Laurie has uh, always been a kind man to me. I watched that. There was another church, Melody Land Christian Center, in front of the main entrance to Disneyland. Had over 15,000 members. And they had an outreach where David Wilkerson preached there every month for 10 years. And I was there every month for 10 years. I would preach there on the third Sunday. David was there on the first. Hal Lindsey was there on the second. That was three Sunday nights in that church every month. And the spread of the gospel was unbelievable. Another thing that Ralph Wilkerson, who was the, no relation to David, but he was a conduit for the charismatic movement nationwide. It was an amazing thing. We saw thousands of Lutherans, Presbyterians, Catholic priests and nuns baptized in the Holy Spirit. We had an amazing run that went on and on and on. I was in it. This one's going to be bigger than that. I'm, I'm going to wait on you. You better shout right now. This one's going to be bigger. Yesterday, I had lunch with uh, the Hunnalls and with Pastor Mark. And I sat there and I said, two pastors of two different churches sitting together in the same city. I said, this is harder to find than lips on a chicken. <laughs> and the love between them was amazing. The absence of any kind of competition or grief was amazing. And I told them and I warned them. This is going to spread. This is going to be the city that will have love and unity between the churches. I'm going to say it again. We're going to have love and unity between the churches. God is doing a new work in me. He's doing a new work in me. I'm going to describe it. You'll see why in a moment. Art tent crusades have got to have permanent results. We are not a band-aid. We don't, my wife and I, the last thing on our mind is a photo op. We don't want a picture of crowds. We want the devil to suffer permanent loss, permanent damage, and a sustained move of God to come on the heels of a tent crusade. Now, I'm not saying this. Others are telling me. People are calling me out of the blue. Mario, that 10 crusade in July, that's going to be a turning point. There's going to come a turning point. He said last year, we, we had Brother Steve healed in his spine, taking multiple pills every day, healed by the power of God. Bree, who was with us in Bakersfield, uh, at death's door with nothing left, healed by the power of God. And on and on and on it goes. But this time, I'm, I'm warning you, you rem testing, one, two, three, testing. This time, heaven is going to rip the sky open and fall in that tent. And you're going to see people simultaneously throwing crutches in the air and dancing before the power of God. How many of you are ready for that? How many of you are ready for that? There's only one stipulation. There cannot be any man featured. There has to be a centrality on Christ. And he must get all the glory, all the glory. I don't even so much as care if I'm even identified or remembered. 
But I'm telling you, on the 16th of July, on the 16th of July, and on the 10th of July, that tent will go up. On July the 10th, I don't care where you are, that tent is going to go up. And when that 40,000 square foot vinyl, and we literally delayed three months. We are using up all the vinyl in America, apparently, because we had to wait on shipment after shipment, and they kept telling us we can't find any more vinyl. But we finally have enough. And, it, and on the 10th of July, man, I'm, I'm losing it right now. On the 10th of July, your volunteers and others, we're gonna put that thing up. And when we put that thing up, all, everybody in this town is gonna know that tent is up. And we're not here to apologize. We're not here to be sleepy. We're here to tell the devil, you are done in Colorado Springs. Your reign of terror is over. The body of Christ, is coming up out of its bomb shelter, taking her place. Her... We better pray in tongues. I can't take it anymore. Raise your hands. Pray in... The Holy Ghost is too strong in here. Jesus. Clap your hands one more time for the King of Kings. Oh. There's a reason God doesn't tell us what he's about to do. We couldn't take it. We couldn't take it. And I want you to understand that we need to start praying now. Right now, like we have never prayed before. Our prayers have got to shift from, Lord, won't you please, to warfare prayer, fiery prayer. The Bible says the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's what James tells us. It doesn't say the prayer of a man avails much. It doesn't say that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's all three, folks, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. My wife will tell you, furniture is not safe in the room where I'm praying. Because I'm not in there to say, Lord, won't you please maybe, oh, thank you, Lord, for your gentle breeze. I don't want a gentle breeze. I don't want the gentle brush of angels' wing. I want warrior angels that'll come down with swords and get devils out of here that have been here for centuries. Am I preaching yet? It's what we need. I don't want you to pray that way anymore. Secondly, God said to tell you this, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. Isaiah 55, eight, my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I'm gonna make my next point, look at me. Your power over depression is the equivalent of what you believe you're on earth to do. You're gonna see what that means in a moment. Depression does not attack the purposeful soldier. It attacks the one who's waiting to know what he's about, who doesn't know his identity. I believe that God is up to something so big in my life that he doesn't dare tell me. But I believe that I have got to get to the place where I understand why I'm still here. Do you know the secret under the message of woke? You know what the secret message is under it? Defeat. 
When you turn a disease into a celebrated life choice, it's because you have admitted defeat. You give out needles in a city when you don't believe they can get off drugs. I'm trying real hard right here. You, you give people the idea that their lifestyle choice, they're wanting to amputate themselves, they're wanting to surgically alter themselves, is a defeat in the psychiatric therapeutic community. You have said, we lost, we give up. Perversion has no cure. Nature has no victory. That's where it is, we're defeated. We give condoms away to youth because we know they don't have self-control and we don't believe they will ever have it. It is defeat, 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 defeat. You don't know, we gotta tell you what to eat, when to wake up, what to believe, what words you should say, what words you can't say. No nation will accept that except slaves. And the American spirit is being killed by defeatism. We can't, we go where they say, now they wanna drive our cars for us. What are we gonna do with that? What are we gonna do with that? Let me tell you what we're gonna do with that. God is going to use me today to take the blinders off your eyes. Uh, let me tell you, you're not a woman alone. You're not a man alone. Now Biden does know what a woman is, but I do. We have a Supreme Court justice that when she was asked, what a woman is, she said, I'm not a biologist. Well, I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you, you're crazy. What are we doing here? What are we on the earth for? Let me tell you something. The first obligation of a general is to take his troops out of certain danger. Isn't that right? Well, if America couldn't be saved, if government couldn't be changed, if disease couldn't be healed and lives couldn't be changed and Americans could not repent, we would have been raptured out of here. The, God would have said, you're out. There's no more good you can do. But our presence, I'm still here. I wake up every, listen, there's a demon on the edge of my bedpost with a walkie talkie and his job is to alert hell when I wake up. He's up, he's awake, he's gonna start preaching any minute now. And I'm standing here to tell you, we are on this earth to win. We are on this earth to prevail. We're on this earth to win soul. We're on this earth to stand up and say, devil, you are defeated in Jesus' name. You can't win, you can't have America. We're gonna be born again nation in Jesus' name. How you doing? So this talk show host says, you're a Christian nationalist. I said, sorry, wake up. I'm a Christian rationalist. <laughs> to let you have the country is irrational. And so here we are and we're in the church. And what is happening is our experience in God is catching up with our worship chorus lyrics. For years we sang about we're an army. There's an army rising up. Never seen an army take so long to rise up. I said, there's no yeast, no, nothing's rising. We're rising up to break every chain. And then we used to sing about we were giant killers. We don't want to go anywhere near a giant. We don't want anyone to think that I'm an unloving person. Well, my dear, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, you're not a housewife. You're not married to a house. 
Here's what you are, dear. You are a spirit-filled, blood-bought weapon in the hand of God. You, sir, are not a dude. You're not a dude. You might speak dude. You might want to dress dude and be a dude, but you're not a dude. You are a blood-bought, Holy Ghost-taught, Spirit-filled warrior in the hand of God. Somebody shout. Is that what you are? So look at me. We would not be here if we couldn't win. The Bible says, blessed be the Lord God who continually leads us in victory. If that victory is out of our reach, it's a lie. We wouldn't be here. Now, let me get to the next point. I had a debate with my son a long time ago. I'm going to show you how long ago it was. He's uh, in his mid-30s. We were having this argument when he was 12. And I said, son, I feel bad for you because your cartoons are terrible. Our cartoons, boomer cartoons, were awesome. <laughs> you have these stick characters that aren't drawn well. We had Bugs Bunny. And I'm telling you, Bugs Bunny was the coolest person in, that, in my life. You know, anyone that would kiss you before he declared war on you was awesome. Anyone that could tie a knot in your shotgun barrel <laughs> was awesome. So then my son said, well, there is one, Dad, you need to be fair. He said, there's this mouse. I said, the last mouse was not overwhelming. So what mouse? He said, well, it's the brain. Pinky and the brain. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. I don't expect anything from the Animaniacs, but I'll watch it. Some of you are staring at me, you're giving me that Colorado Springs look, and uh, where is he going with this? So I'm watching it. And so the one mouse asked the other, he goes, brain, what are we gonna do tonight? His eyes get big, he's a mouse, try to take over the world. I looked at my son, I said, I like this mouse. I said, put yourself in the position of a mouse. What, is, I mean, cheese is the big deal. Your, your life is not great when cheese is at the top of the list. And your claim to fame is you make women jump onto chairs. And you're avoiding cats. And people see you as useless, and you want to take over the world. What we have here is a mental condition where a certain being is saying, my circumstances are irrelevant. I'm smarter than pe what people think I am, and I've got options they've never imagined. Now, this is what I'm gonna tell you. One day, a man sat by a gate, paralyzed. Peter walked by him every day. Same hour of prayer gave him money. My thoughts, not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. The day arrived when God spoke to Mario Murillo and he said, money will never be your concern. I don't want you to ever beg for it. I don't want you to ever make it a basis of anywhere you go. If I lead you to rent a 70,000 seat football stadium, you're to go. If I tell you to go down to an inner city church with 150 people, you go. Because you're no longer going to look at it from your eyes of opportunity and potential. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And so he sat there and Peter walked by him. What was that man's options? 
A good day was a full cup with coins in it. That's a good day. Try to remember what a good day was before you met Christ. And what you believed your options were. So every day he sat there, every day Peter walked by, and God was doing a miracle on both sides of the street. I want you to listen to this. God is doing a miracle on both sides of the street. Outside of the church walls, millions, that's what this book is about, millions are getting ready to be saved. The largest harvest of souls in American history is happening. How do I know it? Let me tell you why I know it. In the Living Bible translation of John 4, 35, it says these words. You say, and we do, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. We have all these preconditions. We got to do this. We got to do that. I met one man that told me, until we know the name of the local devil, we can't cast him out. And that's why we need to spiritually map the area, find out what the demon's name is, call him by name. And I said, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. He didn't know the name of the demon that ruled the place, but he knew the name that would make him leave. I'm gonna say it again, my thoughts are not your thoughts. They're nothing like each other. One day, God is working on Peter. Watch this. God is working on the man at the gate beautiful. They're both being dealt with for a dramatic nitroglycerin convergence, an explosion. An explosion is coming to America. It's gonna hit the campuses. It's gonna be records of people being healed in hospitals. We're gonna hear people that in one moment, I was gonna kill myself and blow my brains out when Christ appeared in my room and I've been born again. You're gonna hear testimony. I'm some of the top, uh, I'm one of the highest paid movie stars in Hollywood and I was doing cocaine and I had all the women I wanted when one day the power of God struck me and I couldn't get up off the floor until I repented of my sin and turned to God. You're gonna read about it. You're gonna hear about it. You, we're not ready for it. And this is why churches that want a calm, predictable program are not going to make any sense in the next few months. Only the churches that are ready for the unexpected. A biker is coming to church. A devil worshiper is coming to church. A politician is coming to church. We can't have regular church. And then the lukewarm Christian will get all offended. Oh, I like my church before we started doing all this. Buy because 10 more are going to replace you as soon as you walk out. Ten more prostitutes, addicts, atheists, devil worshippers from Colorado. They're coming. Get ready. They're coming in Jesus' name. You're yelling, Mario. You're yelling. The devil just said, save your voice. I'm going to test you on that right now. Bartimaeus is blind. He's, somebody said Jesus is over there. He's walking. He's going to be within range of you in the next few minutes. And he starts yelling, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And someone said, quiet down. And it says, so he yelled louder. <laughs> How many of you are like that? Oh, I don't believe. Would you please quiet down? I said, would you please quiet down? You're getting too loud. We're going to offend people. The police are going to come. So, <laughs> you pass with flying colors. Peter isn't praying for the sick and he knows that man is supposed to be healed. Why? The last words 
almost that he heard from Christ. We're in the 16th chapter of Mark. You'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And he is doing it. Because he remembers one thing Jesus said to him. He said, the day's going to come when you will be, someone else will wrap your outer garment around you and take you where you would not go. And the Bible says, by this, he predicted what death he would glorify God. Peter knew he would be a martyr. And so he did the math. As long as Jesus taught, everything was fine. But when they began to be verified by miracles, he became a threat. And Peter knew that. But you see, when you're a man of God and you're supposed to operate in miracles and you don't, something starts eating you up inside. So every day, he's giving that man a lot of money because he's renting days of powerless ministry. This is the rent. I'm paying the rent. I'm paying the rent. But inside, he's getting sick. Volcanoes starting to erupt. You see, I know some of the most famous preachers in America. I don't know how. I don't know why they dare to even talk to me. But they do. And they'll tell me. I know that I have 10,000 members. But I go out of church the most depressed and frustrated person you ever saw. Because I know this is not what God wants. I'm not preaching the sermons I want. I'm preaching the sermons that somebody told me will make the people happy. But one day, God in his infinite mercy was dealing with that man in the cup, with the cup, and dealing with the man of God who is renting days of powerless ministry. And he made him leave his money on the dresser. And we have it totally wrong. We have silver and gold, have I none? It went down like this. You know I'm good for it. I, you know, I'm, I'm good. It's here somewhere. Hang on. And then he said, I don't have any money. And then it hit him. I'm not supposed to have any money. You don't need me to give you money. That's not what you need. I'm waiting for the day for the American church to wake up and say, you do not need all of the stupid things we've been saying to you to keep you from being offended, to keep you, because what we've done is we've gotten your superficial loyalty to us, but you have been deprived of the miracle that God wanted you to have. Now, how many of you believe that it's more important tonight at 6.30 for the people that come to get miracles than for me to preach a popular message. How many of you believe that miracles are more important than popularity? How many of you believe that signs and wonders are more important than the favor of people? Clap your hands in Jesus' name. Well. And I would, I would have loved to have been there when Peter reached critical mass. I don't have any money. I'm tired of having money. I'm tired that this has all been about money. You're not supposed to sit there and beg. You are a, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been set free in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk and throw that cup away because you will never beg again as long as you live. How many of you got, how many of you would get thrilled watching that man say, what? What are you telling me? And he's, his brain is being scrambled. Do what? Walk. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. His miracles are not our miracles. Do you think that when I started my pilgrimage up and down the neediest section of California, Highway 99 from Red Bluff down below Bakersfield, where the gangs are, where the needles are, where the homeless camps are, where the poverty is. And here's a man over there, Frank Saldana. I've, I've got my offices in the Bay Area, and he calls one day and said, would I preach under a freeway? 
And I preached everywhere. I've never preached under a freeway. And so I said, yes, I'd like to preach under a freeway. I don't know who's going to be there, but when I got there, there were 500 lost souls sitting under that freeway. Many of them were homeless. Many of them were addicts because inner city action had gotten them all together for me to preach to. That's right. So now, Frank and I develop a friendship. I said, I like you, you're crazy, I'm crazy. Let's see what kind of craziness God has for us. Then the Lord says, Highway 99 is a river of my glory where the gangs operate, everything from MS-13, everything from the, the red and the blue gangs and they're not Democrats and Republicans. The Norteños, the Soreños, the violence, the crime, you're gonna see thousands say. So we put up our tent. We have did it against the law. Gavin Newsom said, don't put up your tent in Fresno. You're a super spreader. I said, man, I've been called a lot of things. That sounds good right there. And uh, so nobody got COVID, souls get saved, and I didn't think of it. I didn't know. Kenneth Copeland calls me and he says, I see you need a new tent. We're going to buy it for you. So we tell him, well, it's going to, Brother Copeland, it's going to be 100000 He said, we'll give you 100000 He did. Then I found out you're, you're not getting the right size tent. Well, I, it's, well how big should it be? 40,000 square feet? I said, I never thought of that. 40,000 square feet. Over 5,000 people a night. Our first tent crusade was 300 people a night. Now we're going for 5,000 people a night. I'm going to say it again and see if there's anybody who's spirit filled. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They're nothing like your thoughts. So I was telling a guy, man, we got $100,000, but the tent we've got to get is $187,000. Somebody leak that information to Brother Copeland. He called me and he said, I understand I didn't give you enough. So I'm sending you another 100,000 right now. So the tent is paid for. Listen, our sound system is paid for. Our LED wall that we're buying is paid for. Everything is because God is on the move for something bigger than any of us realize. How many of you want to be a part of something big? How many of you want to be a part of something big? Every young person, listen to me. There's a reason the devil is trying to make you fear your future. Because it's so big and such a threat to him. But how do we get over depression? Do you know that for... Americans are weird. Americans are so weird. We're weird. How many years did the doctors tell us to jog? Jog? Well, I, I had an opinion on jogging myself. Bible said the wicked run when no one's chasing them, you know? So. So you couldn't get Americans to jog until someone said, let's run a marathon. So the problem with Americans is that it wasn't long enough. They wanted to go 26 miles. Now here's the same thing. This is the same nation that virtually had no army when both Germany and Japan declared war on us. We had no army. But in the San Francisco Bay Area, we started building two battleships a day. Ford Motor Company in Detroit was building a B-25 bomber every 60 minutes. We revolutionized mass production to defeat evil. That's in our culture, that's in our nature. But the greatest sleeping lion are these people in all over America, millions of, ones like Peter, 
One's like the man at the gate, beautiful. One's a drug addict, a handicapped person, suicidal, a single mom that's desperate. And then there's the church. And inside of the church, there's a core of people that walk out of Christian concerts and they go, that wasn't it. That, that, that was just really hollow. That was empty. There's got to be more. And they, they go to church and they hear sermons that insult their intelligence and placate them and make them sound like at any moment they're going to backslide and trick them into loving God. They, they, it, here's what David McKenna said in the book, Fire in the Fireplace. He said, a congregation will promote a man as a pastor to superstar status if he will agree to keep the rightful demands of God off of their life. But the problem is, mediocrity, if you like it, lukewarmness, if you're toying with it, has its downside. And it's called boredom. You know, depression goes away when you start to say, I'm not on this earth to survive. I'm not on this earth to pay my bills. I'm not on this earth to continually do the same boring rut. The lightning power of God needs to strike your soul. And to say, you are a weapon in my mighty hand. That's what happened to Peter. Because what's happening out there is the phrase, and with it I'm close, I'm done. Because I, I got to preach again tonight. But I'm getting all my preaching done now because tonight is just going to be fire of God falling on, on people. And they're going to get... I gotta, I'm going to finish right now. You say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. But I say to you, look to the fields. Amen. And the living Bible says it this way. Vast fields of human souls are ripening. You know what? Look at me. Woke makes people miserable. Woke takes the color, the feeling, the vitality. There is nothing that has gone woke that is better than it was before. Unanimously, race relations, sexual freedom, sanity, crime, love, every single thing that woke has touched. They cannot point to a result not an iota, not a molecule of success for what woke has done. It has destroyed cities. It has divided churches. It has taken innocent minds and made them absolutely suspicious of everything. And people are, look at me, miserable. Miserable. You can tell how woke someone is because it is to the direct degree that they are not smiling. And suddenly, they're ripening, ripening. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And let me tell you something. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? The church that had a program going when the revival struck and thousands tried to get in their church, but they drove by and said, no, this isn't it. This is just more of what I already have. But then they hear the worship when it's not sung through rote or by melodic indifference, but sung by a redeemed soul, like someone that knows what they've been saved from, and they start singing, and when they sing, you get around them, and I said, man, your voice, just hearing you sing, makes me know that cocaine is going to leave me. 
Fentanyl is gonna leave me. Prostitution is gonna leave me because I feel it. I feel it. Bow your head and close your eyes. Your victory over depression is directly connected to your sense of why you are here on the earth. Once you realize you're behind enemy lines with supernatural power, you will no longer wonder why the drapes aren't prettier in the barracks. You'll never wonder why sometimes things become critical. You'll see it as part and parcel of warfare and that in this war, there are glorious victories to be won. In this war, there are stories to be written that the angels are gonna ask you about for thousands of years. Tell us again how you stood against the tide of depravity in America. Tell us again, when everybody abandoned their post, how you stood your ground. Tell us the story of how Christ operated in you. We'll never be able to sing in heaven the way we can sing here. Oh, we'll enjoy it. We'll see Jesus. But right now the angels are jealous because they can't possibly understand why our voices sound the way they do. I've been saved from something. I've been delivered from something. I've been set free from something. And that's why I sing. Now, I want to stop I'm gonna ask you to do three things before we leave and we'll do them quickly. Number one, I want you to become a volunteer in the tent. Because of what I predict will be the magnitude of the harvest. Because of what I predict will be souls that we will reach in the homeless camps and in the up and, out, the up and in and the down and out, we're gonna reach them all. They're going to feel it when we hand them our card. They're going to say, I need to go to that. My life is so painful. I need to go to that. We need a thousand counselors at the altar for what God is going to give us. And I believe that won't be enough. Please volunteer. Second, bring someone tonight. Because tonight in this house, we will see a distinct dose and foretaste of what the tent will be like. This will turn into a crusade this evening. Don't miss it. I already looked at the TV guide. Everything on tonight is stupid. <laughs> so stupid. People are going to be talking about what God does in this building tonight for a long, long time. You want to see it with your own eyes. Lastly, I want you to get ready to put your hand in the air, wherever you are in this room, for a reason. When you're talking about how life hurts, Mario, you're talking about me. I don't have peace. I don't have purpose. I have to tell you that I'm in a drastic survival mode where every day I'm trying to keep it together. But I need something real. I need Christ to take over my problems, my burdens, my life, my mind. I need Jesus to give me a new life I want to begin living the exciting life that you described. I understand that it is not a painless life, that people will hate me because I will serve God, but I don't care because I know that the reward of being set free, the reward of his presence is so beyond that I, I don't dare lose this treasure on a technicality. I don't dare. I want to pray for you that God will give you peace in your heart. I want to pray for you that God will heal your emotions. I want to pray for you 
that God will give you direction and you will know why you're on the earth. Mainly, I want you to know Jesus. The person who was sent by God the Father to save you. Now, if you are here and you want a new life, you want a new life, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hand in the air and let me pray for you. Say, Mario, I need prayer. I need prayer to know Jesus. I'm not looking for rededication right now. I'm looking for people that want a new life. I want to end the life I'm in and start a new life with Jesus. If that's you and you let me pray for you, put your hand in the air right now. Do it right now. That's it. That's courage. But it's the courage that will lead you to joy unspeakable, full of glory. I want everyone with your hand raised, please stand to your feet. Stand to your feet if you raise your hand. Wherever you are, stand up. Now, would all of you who are standing find the nearest aisle and walk down to the front to get new life? Come, come from wherever you are. Come, we, we want you. Good job, church. Congratulate the people that are coming. To God be the glory. I'd like all of you to remain in the house and not leave. I have one more statement I want to make of clarification because I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. You have done the wisest and the best thing you have ever done in your life by walking down there. It is the best and you will never regret it. What I want to do is make sure that you do it right. So I want you to put your hand over your heart, everyone. The Bible says, go into all the world and make disciples. Not converts, not people who change their values or beliefs. Disciples, create a follower of Christ. That's what I should be doing. In order to do that, I've got to make it very clear that he died for you. And because he died for you, he proved by giving his all to pay the penalty for you. Therefore, you must give your all to him. He, he's not a, a one-shot deal. This is not a temporary fix. This is it. He's Lord and Lord of your life now. So close your eyes. Church, join in as they repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, Son of God, save me now from the power of the devil, from the judgment of hell. Save me now. I repent of all my sin, I repent of everything to receive your new life and to have you, Lord, as the guiding force of my life. I believe my sins are washed away. I believe that I am born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this is a powerful moment. Can we, 
lead them into a prayer area for a few minutes or should it, or do you want to do it here prayer teams were coming all right so we're going to do it here yeah i'd like everyone to stand just a moment don't leave but stand just a moment this is where some of you need to hear from my heart one last statement i think because of my fragmented speaking I said that every four years we get three choices, Mo, Larry, or Curly. I didn't say which party those three were from. I am in deep intercession for Donald Trump, and I want you to listen why. I want him to clarify himself so that the church is not lost in his decision at Mar-a-Lago to have a radical defense of the gay lifestyle. I'm not for that. But I don't, I'm not electing a pastor. I'm electing a president. The second is that I want his eyes to open on his stance on the vaccine. Because he needs to understand the devastation that that medical uh, malpractice has done to the world. Now, having said both of those, I'm believing God that he will come to those knowledges because I certainly can't vote for the other person. I can't. So I wanted you to know I wasn't against Trump. That's my position. Now, this is the important, it, how many of you still love me now? Do you, still, you? All right, thank you. I mean, if he runs, I'm voting for him. So now, bow your heads a moment everyone in the church and workers go ahead and get the information from those that are down here pray with them tonight is a turning point while the tent crusade itself will be a powerful moment the turning point begins tonight Amen. at 6 30. if you arrive early and we fill the house early we'll begin early Come early. Bring someone with you. Keep your heads bowed as Pastor Todd comes right now.